Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching this in-depth ag forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. I'd like to start off where we left off with on Friday, and that's a look at the pattern we've been in and how I think both the combination of the uh, La Nina that's developing, possibly reaching a peak, and the MJO are kind of teaming up to give us a pretty strong teleconnection out of the tropics, and this is what I'm talking about. Since the beginning of November, we have really favored a ridge that sat here over parts of the southwest. We've seen deep troughs that have cut into the Gulf of Alaska and really targeted their flow into British Columbia. That flow has then run over that ridge and dove into a deeper trough that's been anchored over the Great Lakes states. And then it kind of comes out here into the Pacific to a big blocking ridge. Now that's the pattern we've been in. And remember, we know that when we have the MJO in phase five, while there's a La Nina, that's what we get. You see it right here? There's that ridge, the deeper trough, and the big block downstream. Now if we move out of MJO phase five, into phase six and seven. That's gonna see this pattern progress. It's gonna first open up, and then we're gonna to have to pay attention to what happens to the extension of the jet stream. I'm gonna come back to that in a few seconds. But I would like to give you the latest updates on what that pattern got us in the month of November. We can see that we have way more climate reporting districts across the United States that have shown up as being dry in November. And this followed a very wet October, right? But we've gone over dry and we have yet to develop any sense of that strong subtropical jet stream, which we've been talking a lot about, which is why much of the Midwest, but from California through Texas over to the East Coast here, have really missed out on some major, <clears throat> excuse me, precipitation events. On the temperature side of this though, that ridge has kept much of the desert southwest warm, and we've let quite a bit of cold air out. In fact, we still have freeze warnings out for tomorrow morning, on Tuesday morning, for a big section of Alabama, uh, Georgia, and Florida, the northern part of Florida. Okay, I told you I want to talk about the, the combination of this La Nina and MJO as kind of our main teleconnection, so let's get to it. This is where we currently sit with our ocean temperature pattern. And what we've seen throughout much of this fall is the extension of those trade winds get pretty far to the east. They've sat at times all the way here. That's where the biggest anomalies have been. Now, if this La Nina begins to fade, we will not see the extension of these trade winds getting this far to the east. They'll back off. And if they back off, that'll let the MJ, which has been kind of stuck right over here in phase five for a while, move east with it through phase six into seven possibly to eight. Now the question is, when do I think that's gonna happen? Because we've been watching this La Nina develop for a while. Let this animation restart here. It's almost to the end, there we go. This is gonna go back 90 days to August 31st. And you're gonna see the colder water emerging here on those strong trade winds, all right? We also got the colder water here that showed up throughout the month of October and has stayed in place into November now, to the end of November. But are we starting to see this particular pattern slow down? Because I'll assess the temperature pattern here in Nina region 3.4, but we'll also take a look at it much closer to Af uh, excuse me, towards South America as well, Nina region 1 plus 2, which is there, okay? When I look out there, this is what I see. Nina region 3.4. That was the cooling since September. We then had a brief shot where it warmed up right in through here, and then since then it stayed pretty steady. I do not expect this to continue to drop. I think that the, the, the floor of these ocean temperatures will be about one degree Celsius, and I think we're gonna to start to see this rebounding probably at some point in the month of December. Nino region one plus two, right up next to South America. It did the same thing. See it dropping off there in September and October. Then it made a big drop here, which has really affected South America uh, by dropping off into this uh, territory down here, about one and a half degrees below. But I don't expect it to continue to drop off. I expect it, expect it to stay steady or start to come back up soon. My reasoning for that is two things. One, climatologically, this is what happens. El Ninos and La Ninos reach a peak in December and January. So what we have to ask ourselves is, if that's the case, and we have the second point, which is model evidence that this is gonna happen, what does that mean for the pattern in December and even into early January? Because November temperature anomalies forecast by the models, very good. This is exactly what we saw. So watch, in December, still have the cooler water in place here. See that, all right? But the question is, where is it going? Because by January, now we start to see it backing off. Watch these colors, ready? January to February, March, April. I'm just gonna go ahead and let it go all the way out to May. You saw that from January through May, the cooler waters have moved south. Warmer water is starting to show up here. 
We still have some cooler water in place there. Now this pattern is one I'm going to talk a lot about over the coming weeks and months because should this materialize, this will have a major influence on the jet stream pattern come early spring. And we'll, we'll diagnose that and discuss it soon. But in the near term, if the MJO, which is connected to this potentially peaking La Nina, is going to respond, if that MJO is going to respond, this is what I'd expect it to do. It's really loved phase four and five. You say, why? Well, that's where the nose of this trade winds has been, what we call the maritime continent. That's north of Australia. But if it starts to move out of phase five into phase six in the first week of December and possibly weekly over into phase seven, or even keep coming around the diagram with time, this is going to signal a pretty big pattern shift coming out of the, uh, out of the tropics. And I want to show you what that means. Ready? We know what phase five gives us. This is what we've been seeing. Phase six, watch this ridge right here, okay? From phase five to phase six, the ridge opens. We tend to get better flow coming through the Gulf of Alaska. That's associated with the East Pacific Oscillation. And it could target the, um, you know, the West Coast. But this is second week of December that I'm talking about here. But as this ridge opens up, it's going to take some warmer and drier conditions along with it. Now watch what happens. If we go into phase seven, what I will be most interested to see so watch it again, five, six progresses, seven extends a long piece of the jet stream here in the Pacific. And you'll notice you don't get a strong correlation here over the West or the Midwest. There still seems to be a trough there, but the ridging over the North Atlantic seems to move toward Europe. If this is the case, this continues to give us a very active storm track, but the West will go over to a wetter pattern because this piece of the jet stream you see right here, and this is a live map, this is what it looks like on, on a Monday night here, will continue to get this, but it will start to move toward Oregon, Washington, and California. It won't stay so targeted here on British Columbia. Now we'll have to wait till the second half of winter before we see the subtropical portion of the jet stream show up, which is why in the longer term, the southern part of the United States from California to Texas, South Carolina, without that component, is going to continue to stay like what we've seen on the drier side of it. It's not that you won't get any precipitation. It's just not a wet pattern. So let's go take a look at it. Ready? Uh, this is what I've got here from the, uh, from the European model. We're looking out all the way to, let's take it one more day here. How about to January 10th? December 10th to January 10th. You can see the models are favoring, they've continued to favor the wetter conditions in the west. We've got an active Ohio River Valley storm track, but there's no major indication that this area is going to go over to above average precipitation because of the lack of that subtropical jet stream. The northern tier of the United States, clipper systems. They're going to come through the Canadian prairie into the Great Lakes. I don't expect that to slow down much at all. And what I think we're going to have to watch to see happen is if we can start to pull away from the big ridge that's over the west, lower that jet stream to make this occur. Because I'll show you something here. Uh, over the next couple of weeks, so while we're waiting on that to occur, in fact, let's do this first. There you go. That ridge through the end of this week, and I'm playing it fast, but all the way through next week, it's there. See it? So the flow's coming over the top and down like that. That ridge is in place through the first week of the month. But take a look. Getting into week two... Now we see a little different pattern. See that coming around like that? Possibly giving us some southwest flow, anchoring the coldest air here. That shift is one that I'm going to be watching very carefully. So let's see what it does in the near term since we've already looked out December 10 through uh, January 10. Let's now just see what it does over the next week. We're drier here over the next week. And because there's no strong onshore flow in the west, we're drier. It's all in British Columbia. But watch. As we play this forward, this is a seven-day sliding window. Let's stop it right here. This is day four through day 10, which gets us all out to the 9th of December, okay? You'll notice that getting firmly into week two, what happens? We start to see less of an indicator of really dry conditions in the midsection of the United States. We still have our clippers coming around, but notice we brought the wetter conditions farther into the Pacific Northwest. This could be the mid-month pattern shift that we're watching for if the MGO transitions into phase seven. And phase seven could take us on a pretty wild ride across the United States. Get ready for that mid-month. So I'll come back to it one more time. This is our precipitation pattern from December 10 through January 10 from the brand new European. To me, it follows La Nina and MJO phase six, seven transition to the T. That's what I'm seeing. What about those temperatures? Well, let's do this. 
Let's look at a seven day sliding window. Let me take you back to the beginning here. A lot of mild air in place through the first week of December and even part of the second week. But take a look what happens mid-December, ready? Pattern shift comes on and the colder air that's being stored up in Alaska comes out, seems like for the second half of the month. And that's consistent with what's going on with the MJO and La Nina. That's what we typically get. Um, so I buy into this right now. I buy into the European models forecast. And in addition to that, I think that the CFS V2 has got it right with precipitation as well. You see, for that time period, December 13th through the 19th, we still hang on to the drier conditions here. But look at the west transitioning first. Canadian Prairie, still active storm track here. When we get into the December 20 to 26th time period, now we see that active storm track corridor showing up here. Hits the Great Lakes, comes through the Midwest, and also the west looks wetter. So that's some pretty good agreement. You see that map there? Look, we come back here and show you this on the precipitation side of it. It's the same thing for that time period. That's pretty strong agreement and I can buy into that. So that's your long range, that's what I'm watching. Now, over the last 14 days, we saw this earlier, but I wanna give you another view of it. Last 14 days, it's been quite dry across much of the United States. You see more dry area than anything else. And we've had some snow as of late. In fact, this hit some pretty big football games over the weekend, didn't it? What you're looking at right here, though, is the snowfall that we got in the last 72 hours. It's come across the Great Lakes, and I think it's going to continue to do that. Now, if we look just big picture the next 10 days, this map shows you the probability of getting greater than a half of an inch of precipitation, okay, half of an inch of precipitation uh, over the next 10 days. There's a big area in through here that's looking pretty dry. There's your Alberta Clipper storm track, right? When do we start to pull this moisture in? Well, let's talk about that. But first, just show you another way. European operational shows, again, drier in through here for most of the next week and drier here until we get that jet stream to transition. The way to look at it is just do a model comparison here. You're going to see at least four, let's get that view right, there we go, at least four clipper systems that come out of Canada and come in and do something like this. You ready to see them? GFS left, European right. As we play this forward, you just watch each clipper come in about one a day through the middle of the week, through Thursday, another one coming in on Friday. I mean, do you just see it? They just keep sweeping in like this. It's in both models. So lake effect snow. I'll show you how much snow to expect in through here. When do we finally start to pull in some moisture? Well, I want you to watch this. On Saturday, getting in Saturday morning to Saturday afternoon, the GFS's got the low here and the main frontal boundary there. Your pin, interestingly enough, is quicker. It's got a more uh, quickly advancing front, but this will actually draw in some moisture into parts of Texas over toward the lower Mississippi River Valley. That's the weekend, some of the precip coming through here. We're going to watch a system that follows that on Sunday. The European flatter wave through the Great Lakes, the GFS a deeper wave that cuts here and brings a much larger low that comes into this area. Now we're out here pretty far in the forecast. This is next Sunday getting into early Monday morning, but I want you to be watching it. Until then, it's just clipper after clipper after clipper after clipper that comes through here. When do we start to bring that better onshore flow into the Northwest? It'll be next week. So taking all of that, let's compare the models over the next seven days. European model, Quicker to bring the moisture into the Pacific Northwest, but the GFS is wetter across this region, the, North, uh, the Dakotas, through some of the Great Lakes states down here into the Ohio River Valley. That's the main model differences. Total precip, this is what I got through the next seven days. You can see that that's the main storm track. We're drawing this moisture up over the weekend. Other than that, much of the rest of the United States is dry. Okay, They're just coming in through here, going to New England, and the stronger onshore flow into British Columbia. All right, from there, let's talk snow. This is see how much we're going to get here. In fact, let me blow this up a little bit. There we go. A lot of light snow events. When the clippers come through, they can put down quite a bit. But if I just take you out here to next Monday night, there's a pretty good corridor, four to six inches in through this area, much higher amounts on the downwind side of the Great Lakes and in the interior parts of New England. But there's too much warm air in through here to get that snow any farther south. So we better start talking about that warm air. First of all, we still got to get the cold air out of the east. There's freeze watches and freeze uh, warnings here in parts of Alabama, uh, uh, Georgia, and Florida. We got that cold air in place, but look at this. By the time we get to the middle of this week, the flow is going to run over the mountains, come down into the plains. And when it does that, you get what's called compressional or adiabatic warming. 
And what happens is as the air is compressed, as it sinks over, it gets very dry and it gets hot. You ready for this? We already saw these high temperatures today on Monday. But as we play into Tuesday, look at that warmth spreading under that broader ridge. Wednesday, there could be a pocket up here under that compressional warming, those strong westerly winds that are anywhere between 25 and maybe 35 degrees above normal. And it just spreads Thursday right here into the central plains of the United States. In fact, the only place in the U.S. on Thursday that's still looking to be colder than normal is down here in Florida. That's pretty amazing. So what about Friday? Getting into the weekend, there's Saturday. Getting into Sunday, well, let's just keep, take a look at how this goes into week two. Coming up here, let's get into day five through 10. Now at this point, that ridge is still in place, all right? but we're starting to see a bit of a transition in it. That's when we get into MJO phase seven at about day 10 uh, to day 11 and 12. And watch what happens, ready? Now you see that colder air coming out. This is that mid-month transition where I think we're gonna start to see a repeat of that colder air coming across the eastern two thirds of the US, and better onshore flow into the west. That seems to be the way this whole pattern seems to shake down. Now, since we're talking about temperatures, give me 30 more seconds here. I'm going to show you a couple other areas. The first one's going to be what I see out here in Europe. The month of December 10 to January 10 favors cold air. In fact, we got 10 very cold days coming up here in Scandinavia. So we're going to watch that carefully. Also, just to kind of continue with the conversation about Australia, you see it here. They've been very wet throughout the month of November, and the forecast is for the you know December 10 to January 10 to really favor above normal precipitation in Queensland, New South Wales, and Victoria, and could be drier over toward Perth. And this is very important for the wheat markets right now. So I'll keep you up to date on all of it. Give you another update later on this week. Until then, have a good one. Thanks.